Jesus showed up on the public scene, there was an expectation that he would be a strong governmental leader. The expectation of the day was that that's exactly what the Messiah would do, that he would come and forcibly overthrow the corrupt current system and establish the kingdom of God. Because that's what the prophets had said about the Messiah, is that he would establish the kingdom of God. And there were numerous passages that gave support to that. A couple that I'm thinking of this morning, Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, where Daniel said he saw one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he approached the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. He was given authority to rule and glory and a kingdom so that every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Jeremiah the prophet, chapter 23, verse 5, he said, The days are coming, and this is the Lord's declaration, when I will raise up a righteous branch of David, and he will reign wisely as king and administer justice and righteousness in the land. That sounds like a strong governmental leader. And that's what people expected when Jesus came onto the public scene. However, what they did not expect was for a humble farmer to show up. Because that's how Jesus identified himself, as a sower of seeds. So with that, we look at probably his best known of all parables, which really is largely about his work and by extension, our involvement with it. The first nine verses of Matthew chapter 13, we're told that Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea, and large crowds gathered to him, so he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd was standing on the beach. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. Others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Few of Jesus' stories are easier to understand than this one. The farmer went out to sow the seed, and the seed fell on four different types of soil. Some of the seed fell on the road, the path. Some of it, he says, fell on the rocky soil. Some of it fell on the thorny soil. And ultimately, some of it fell on the good soil. Jesus gave a very clear explanation of the parable. If you look down in verses 18 to 23, if there's any doubt at all as to what he meant by the story, he explained it carefully when he said, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom the seed was sown beside the road. The one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself but is only temporary, and when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is, he says, the man who hears the word, and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So again, he tells a simple story, 
And he gives us a very, very clear understanding of what this story is really all about. He first of all talks about the seed. It's really not that much about the sower. It's called the parable of the sower quite often. But it's really the parable of the seed and the soil because that's really the, the main components of the story. So first of all, he wants us to understand about the seed itself. And you notice here in Matthew's gospel, he calls it the word of the kingdom. The message of the kingdom that Jesus was continually sowing. And so he says that that word of the kingdom, first of all, some of that seed falls upon the path. There are those that hear that word about the kingdom, but they are not at all responsive to it. Their, their hearts are hard as stone, just like a, a pathway. And so they have no room for that message. They're unwilling to receive it into their heart. Notice he says the devil comes immediately and snatches it away. And that's very significant because we have an enemy who is very much aligned against the purposes of Jesus he doesn't want people hearing this message about the kingdom. He doesn't want people hearing the gospel. So the enemy, if he sees somebody has a hard heart and has no place for it, snatches it away immediately before there's any chance for them to, to rethink their response to it. He then talks about the word of the kingdom being sown on the rocky soil. We might say that's the shallow believer. The individual that says, oh, that's great stuff. I'm all about it. Immediately receives that into his heart. But there is no depth at all to commitment. And so persevering in the midst of adversity just does not happen. He talks about the thorny soil. The word of the kingdom that is sown in the thorny soil. There is receptivity. But there are worldly concerns like weeds that grow. And begin to crowd out the productivity of the word of the kingdom. But then there is that good soil. There are those individuals that hear his message, that receive it into their hearts, that understand it. And it grows and becomes productive so that eventually it bears fruit. And so those are the responses to the word about the kingdom. Again, I believe this whole story is a commentary on how Jesus and his word of the kingdom is received and that is the gospel, Jesus and the message concerning the kingdom. In some of the other parallel gospels, this seed is defined a little differently. Mark chapter 4, verse 14, the seed is simply called the word. In Luke's gospel, chapter 8, verse 11, it is called the word of God. All of those are phrases and words to describe the gospel, the good news. The good news of Jesus and the things concerning the kingdom of God. As I've shared before, I believe it is best described, the gospel is best described in the last two verses of the, of the end of the book of Acts. Chapter 28, Acts 28 verses 30 and 31, referring to the Apostle Paul, who it says, welcomed all who came to him in, in his prison. He was in a rented quarters as a prisoner. He welcomed all who came to him, and it says that he proclaimed the kingdom of God, and he was teaching the things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with full boldness and without hindrance. That's the seed that the sower sows. And of course, Jesus referring to himself sowing that seed, it makes perfect sense then that the gospel, by extension down to us, would be the sower, Jesus who gave his life to, to put it all into effect and the message that he was about, sowing the word of the kingdom of God. That is the gospel, the word of the kingdom and the good news concerning Jesus Christ and that gospel being quietly and almost secretly doing an inside job in the lives of people even today and doing an inside job even on the, the present system of this world. And that's really what all of his parables were about. This message, this gospel of the kingdom that I proclaim to you, it's doing this kind of an inside job on people and in the world. You think about it in terms of the wheat and the tares described also here in chapter 13. The parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the yeast in the dough. All of them about the secret work uh, of the, the gospel message. Again, Jesus and the work of the kingdom of God. 
So these parables are statements of how Jesus is working and by extension how he wants to work through us, his people, the church. And there's some great lessons and applications for us in what we do with this great truth. For one thing, Jesus has not called us to forcibly try to overthrow the present system. That's not how he did it, and that's not how he expects us to do it. He did not try to reform the present system. He's not expecting us to do it either. He has not called us to any kind of forced allegiance to or compliance with his message, like they tried to do in the Crusades a long time ago. Accept this message or die. He's not called us to be forceful with it. What he has called us to do is exactly what he did, and that is to indiscriminately sow the seed of the gospel. And as we do it, as he did it, it gets mixed results. Sometimes it's effective, seemingly. Other times, apparently, it is not. We are called along with Jesus to sow the seed. Sowing the seed is nothing forceful. In many ways, it is nothing impressive. And in some ways, it is, is not apparently effective. Because when you think about sowing a seed as a farmer sows a seed in the springtime, nothing appears to happen immediately. The seed is sown and that seems to be it. Because it's the beginning of a process. It requires patience. But it is the process, and that is the beginning of the process by sowing the seed. Reminded of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. There's a great lesson in that. We're nothing so special if we sow the seed. We're just being faithful. We're just those workers that God is using, that Jesus is using. And so the sowing of the seed, it's an important thing, but the, the sower's not that important. Just getting the, the seed out there is. Because God is the one that causes the seed to grow, and there's where the priority is. The one who can make the growth happen. I think about an elderly farmer in a previous pastorate that made a statement on several occasions and to kind of paraphrase what he said he said farmers are the biggest gamblers of all he says they gamble in sowing the seed that by sowing the seed they gamble that eventually there's going to be a harvest and he stated the effect that if we as farmers are wise we will realize that only God can give a harvest and that fits in a spiritual level as well doesn't it sure we gamble of sorts because we take the seed of the gospel and, and we scatter it out there like Jesus talks about in the parable. We scatter the seed and it's kind of a gamble because we don't know the results. And, and in reality, we can't do anything about the results. All we can do is be the sowers. It is God who causes the harvest. It is God who causes the growth. And so in faith, we rely upon God to do what God uniquely can do. But we think about the great potential of the seed that we sow. We come back to that seed, that gospel seed. The seed has tremendous potential. Even in nature, a seed has tremendous potential because the seed has the raw materials for what we might call a transformational miracle. Because that seed can become a plant. It can become a bush. It can become a tree that can produce life-giving fruit. So a seed has great potential. The gospel seed has great potential. There are two verses that remind us of the tremendous potential of the gospel seed. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Peter says, you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. We're born again through the miraculous work of of a seed, the gospel seed found in the word of God. And so he reminds us, you have been born again. You've experienced a miracle. You're born again, not through a perishable seed like we see in nature, but a seed that is imperishable through the living word of God. As we get into the word and the word gets into us, that seed is implanted in our lives. 
And we are born again. And so Peter would remind us of what the seed of the gospel has done for us. In James chapter 1, verse 21, James appeals to us to humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save you. That seed of the gospel. So we see the great potential of the seed. Because you know, nothing can happen with the seed if it is not sown. This is kind of stating the basics. But if the seed remains in the sack, if the seed is not scattered out to the soil, nothing can happen. But things can happen in varying degrees when the seed is sown. I guess I'm a little nostalgic today, but I'm thinking back over the years that I've served as a pastor, that I've sought to be faithful with the seed of the gospel. And I think about my experiences in sowing the seed with various kinds of soil over the years. I think about some that I have sought to share the gospel with that were like the path in the parable, like the pavement, like the road. They were very hardened to the gospel, and it became immediately apparent. Start to talk about the gospel, start to talk about spiritual truth, and I could see their eyes kind of glaze over. It's like, I don't want to hear this, don't want to talk about this. And sometimes they were polite and just simply rejected it. There are others who got defensive. There were some that got hostile, wanted to run me out of the room. Others that wanted to debate rather than to listen and to learn. But it was pretty obvious that in terms of the seed of the gospel, they were like pavement. They were like the path. Their hearts were as hard as stone. They had no room for the gospel. I think about others that I have shared gospel with, and they were shallow like the seed sown on the rocky soil. They listened and they received it into their hearts apparently with great eagerness. And I remember having high hopes for some of those individuals, thinking, wow, this is going to be great. I can see great things happening in their lives for the cause of Christ and the kingdom. But like the parable, it soon became rather obvious that there was no substance after the initial excitement died down. And sadly, they went another way. Christian initiatives and Christian priorities just did not have a place in their lives. They were a lot of talk up front, but there was no real substance. Others I've shared the gospel with that were distracted, like the seed sown on the thorny soil. Genuine conversion. They received the gospel into their lives. They hit the ground running, so to speak. Again, high hopes for them, thinking, wow, they're, they're going to make a huge difference. But then they got distracted. They didn't really sink down their roots like they should have. Other things got in the way. They, they got too busy. They just never had the time to really cultivate the life of Christ in their lives. And so they were overly consumed with work or family or hobbies. The growth was not productive. But there were many others who've been receptive to the gospel message. Genuine conversion, baptized and hitting the ground running and devoting themselves to the disciplines and, and sinking down roots in Bible study, in prayer, in service, in Christian fellowship. And the greatest joy of all, that eventually they would bear the fruit of disciple making. That they were so productive that they replicated their lives into the lives of others and a, and a chain of progress began. And what joy. Some of the greatest joy has to be of those to which the gospel has been most effective. In all of this, I was thinking about what we looked at last week a couple chapters over in Matthew chapter 11. We talked last week about the yoke of discipleship. Because when the seed is most productive, it brings us to being a, a full-fledged disciple of Christ and replicating our lives. And I think about the yoke of discipleship as we think about this parable. And I come back to verse 29 of Matthew 11, where Jesus invites us and says, All of you, take up my yoke and learn from me because I'm gentle and humble in heart and you'll find rest for yourselves. This has been rather personal for me this week. In my quiet times, I've sat down and visualized that picture of the yoke that I shared with you last week. And I've pictured myself making a decision to put my neck in the yoke along with Jesus. And that's been not so easy. 
because I've thought about what exactly I was doing. Do I really want to risk putting my neck in the yoke with Jesus to go the direction that he's going, in the pace that he's going? Because I'm saying with an unqualified response, I'll go where you're going and I'll do what you're doing. And I realize that might take me in some directions I'm not terribly comfortable with. And so I, I've struggled with that in my quiet time, but deep down I'm saying, I, I want to do that. I want to do that. I, I want to really be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I want to learn his gentle and humble ways because I know he's not going to strong arm me into putting my neck in the yoke. It's an invitation. If you'll just come and do this, you can learn some great qualities from me and we can go in a direction that's going to be a valuable direction. And I've realized thinking about that and looking at what we're looking at here today, to put our necks in the yoke of discipleship will involve partnering with Jesus in his work of sowing the seed of the gospel. That much I'm certain of. Exactly how that works out, I'm learning. We're learning. But I believe that with all my heart, that to submit to the yoke of discipleship, Jesus wants us to be sowers of the seed. He wants us to get the gospel out there. So I think there's really two key takeaways from the parable of the sower and even reflecting back at what we looked at last week. There are two key issues and questions before us. The first one is, what kind of soil am I? How am I responding? to the seed of the gospel in my life. And I think the four soil types give us an opportunity to do a little bit of self-evaluation. Let's start with the first one, the pavement. And we don't need to spend much time there because I, I think I can safely say you're exempted from that. Because if that fit you, you would not be here and you would not be listening because you wouldn't care about the gospel in any way, shape, or form. So let's dispatch with that. We can be done with that one. Secondly, the rocky soil raises some questions. Am I wilting amidst adversity? Is my commitment based more on feelings than on substance? Do I find, if I'm really honest, that I'm lacking regular Bible reading and Bible study as a discipline in my life? That I'm not spending much time in prayer? Not much time together in fellowship or service. That's an uncomfortable one, but it raises those questions. The other kind of soil, the thorny soil, causes us to do some evaluating of ourselves. Do I easily make excuses for not being committed to spiritual disciplines and fellowship and involvement? And the good soil. Is there evidence of fruit bearing in my life? Am I actively sowing? the gospel seed in the lives of others? Am I deliberately seeking to make disciples of those responsive? Who am I sharing with? Who am I discipling? The good soil causes us to ask those kinds of questions. The second key issue out of Jesus' parable that comes up is, what am I doing with the seed? What am I doing with this gospel seed mentioned in the parable? It's kind of interesting that sowing seed over a broad area is called broadcasting. Before the electronic media ever grabbed a hold of that word, farmers had it. Because farmers out sowing seed in, in the field were considered broadcasting. They were sowing the seed over a wide area, dispersing it over a wide area. Of course, we think about broadcasting in terms of radio and television in particular. And we can say that we also are called to broadcast the seed. We are called to, to sow the seed as broadly as we possibly can. That's why it's interesting to talk about the parable of the sower on a day when we emphasize missions. Because we realize the seed is being sown broadly way out there in other lands and countries and cultures that we probably don't even begin to understand unless we've been there. But the gospel seed is going out far and wide and that's exactly what the parable of the sower says it should be doing. It should go out as far as it possibly can. And so the seed needs to go out to a distance. But it also needs to go out locally right where we are. And so it needs to go out to neighbors, needs to go out to family members where we are. But I think it also puts a burden upon us to use mass media. And this is something I believe passionately for a lot of years 
But I believe we have responsibility to get it out beyond our own immediate circle. And we live in one of the greatest ages of all to do that. We don't have to spend big bucks to get on television or radio, although doing that's a fine thing. We've got the internet. Some said it was the devil's tool for a while. It is. But it's also God's tool. Social media. Who's not on Facebook these days? Pretty much everybody. Or at least some form of social media. Are there not ways that we can sow the gospel seed in social media, the internet, and, and getting it out there way, way beyond our, our local area? Yes, we can. As a church, we're doing, we're, we're doing that even right now. And so we're seeking to be faithful to those kinds of things, sowing the gospel seed. So what is our response? What is your response? How is the seed of the gospel, first of all, growing in your life? And secondly, how are you sowing gospel seed? As we learn from the parable of the sower, even from the life of Jesus, it will not be 100% effective. If Jesus didn't have 100% success, why in the world would we imagine we would? But the point that he was making and the lesson for us is he sowed the seed indiscriminately. It didn't matter that it fell on some that were not responsive or others that were marginally responsive. He sowed the seed. And he calls us to sow the seed as well. And so while there will be mixed results as to what we do, we are involved in a project that is ultimately successful in the truest sense of the word. And I base that upon the words of Isaiah the prophet in chapter 55, verses 10 and 11, when he said, For just as rain and snow fall from the heaven and do not return there without saturating the earth and making it germinate and sprout and providing seed to sow and food to eat, so my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. Amen. That is our confidence. If we sow his seed, it will accomplish what he wants. Let us be faithful to partner with him to do that very thing.